Hi there, I'm Lori Heil and I'm the Groups Director. We're so glad you could join us this morning. My name is Amy Juvenal and I am the Youth Director here at the church. Whether you are joining us in person or online, we are so glad that you're here. Here at Free Church, we are a multi-generational church from different backgrounds, different traditions, but we all come together to celebrate Jesus Christ. During our service, you'll experience contemporary worship, a snapshot from our kids' ministry, and an encouraging message from Pastor Rick. If you want to contribute to our offering, you can do that online. Go to your preferred app store and download our eFree Church app and look for this icon right here. And you can give financially that way through our app. If you are here in person, we also have offering boxes in the back where you can drop your offering in as you leave the service. We'd love it if you'd connect with us, so fill out that connect card, which is on our eFree Church app. And you can connect with us online through Facebook, Instagram, or at efreebn.org. Thanks so much for joining us today. Enjoy the service. Hey everyone, I'm Dawn Summers and I'm the Director of Children's Ministries here at EFC. Welcome to the E-Free Kids Minute, where we will share a quick overview of what we've been learning and what you can focus on as a family in about 60 seconds. Let's go. In this week's lesson, we meet Joseph, Jacob's favored son, whom he gifted with a beautiful coat. After sharing his dreams with his family, Joseph's brothers were really angry, and they sold him into slavery to some Ishmaelite traders, who took him to Egypt. This is where things went from bad to worse. Joseph was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and thrown into prison for many years. However, we find that in this story, God redeems all of Joseph's hardships for blessing. To learn more from our lesson this week, go to the Lifeway for Kids app. Select the Gospel Project for Kids from the list of curriculum. Then choose the light version to download because it's free. And this is where you can watch the Bible teaching video. As you experience this week's lesson with your kids, remind them that just like Joseph, we cannot escape the hardships and suffering of life. However, God always redeems. Whether it's in the time or way that we hope he will, that's up to him. However, we can trust that God will give us more of himself, even during our sufferings, if we are open to it. Thanks so much for joining us, and we will see you next week on Facebook with more ways to connect with our community. Have a great week. You can find the eFree Kids Facebook group by going to our eFree Church page, clicking More, and searching Groups.
Pastor Rick here at EFC, and thanks for joining us on uh, this weekend. I hope you're all doing well, uh, whether you're here locally uh, in Bloomington Normal, uh, whether you're maybe up in the Chicago area, East Coast in Connecticut, maybe it's the UK, wherever you're at, Arizona, Florida, just thanks for tuning in and being with us. Um, those that are using our church platform, I encourage you, if you have never done this before, sign in. And there's a place to chat, there's a place for prayer requests, and it's just a great way to connect. And, and so not only to, to, to hear and, and maybe get some, some content and some encouragement that way, but maybe you might uh, be able to chat a little bit. And, and we have a good time in that chat. So you got to sign in on the platform to do that. Uh, our hosts are there to pray with you if you have a need. And um, also the Connect card, I'm going to ask the host to do that now. And uh, you, can, you can put that up there for that Connect card and do that again later on the service to just, uh, if you've got a prayer request, we just would love to be able to pray for you as well. So we're in our second part of our generation, uh, generation talk, our generosity talk. And uh, we're excited about this little series about generosity. And today we're going to talk about this whole idea of action, about action. Last week, it was all about awareness, all about awareness. And interesting, I don't know if you had a chance to pray the prayer. Um, the prayer that I actually we gave last week was this. That God, I want to experience the joy that comes from being generous. I ask that today that you give me the opportunity to be generous. That anything comes my way that I'll recognize when it does, 
I'll have the courage to jump in and just take action. Now, I'm telling you, um, I've talked to a few people from the church and uh, uh, in particular, and they had more opportunities this week. Um, I have been on overload with opportunities um, to give with my time and my attention and uh, very, very thankful um, for those opportunities. And so part of what we described last week is just simply in order to be generous, you have to have an awareness. You just have to have an awareness. And um, because God has called us into his kingdom to work in this world by being a blessing to other people uh, in a variety of ways. Because one of the misnomers about generosity is that it's not just about money. We can be generous with other things like our thoughts, our words, of course our money, our influence, our time, our attention, and our belongings. Matter of fact, if anybody wants a, a piano, we're trying to get rid of a piano just for free. Just come pick it up. Um, and we'd love to give that to you as a blessing to you. See, generosity isn't just about money. It's about so much more. It's about taking, as we shared last week, your entire life, all of who you are, everything that you are, and everything that you own, and using it to bless other people around you. Because as I mentioned last week, what is yours, what is mine, is not really ours. We're just stewards of what God has blessed us. That's about the awareness last week. This week, I want to talk about activating, <clears throat> activating our generosity. The desire to be generous is important. But if you ever notice in life, desire alone does not make us generous or in any other area of life. If we want to live a life of generosity, then we have to make a decision. We have to get active. Um, it reminds me so much of my efforts to become physically more healthy over these last couple of years. Um, it wasn't only because I looked in a mirror and, and saw some things that I wanted to change, but also as the doctor was telling me, I need to go on a little bit of uh, cholesterol medication, a little bit of high blood pressure medication. I've always struggled with gout. That's kind of a familial thing. It goes through the generations. And it was just time a couple of years ago. It says, you know what, if I, I, I want to make some changes. Um, I was aware. I was aware by the doctor. I was aware by the, the mirror, so to speak. I needed to change my diet. I needed to exercise to be a more healthy person. I had to move from desire to action. I had to move from desire to action. And it made me work. I, I had to do things differently. I had to take a look at what I was taking in, what I was eating, when I was eating, tracking calories. I, I had to take a look at setting aside a time for the gym and working out appropriately and getting it into my calendar. You have to move from awareness, from desire, to actually making a decision and acting on it. So here's my question. The same thing is true with generosity. If you want to become a more generous person, and who wouldn't? I mean, we're called if you're a Christian listening here today and, you know, whatever you're doing right now, if, if you're a Christian, you're called. I'm called. I, I want to be more like Jesus. And Jesus was the most generous person that humankind has ever, ever witnessed. The question becomes, and we have to do this on purpose. So the question becomes, what are you doing right now to be more generous? What are you going to do today that blesses another person? See, once you move from desire you know, to being generous, to actually being generous. When you make decisions and you, and you decide to be active and you start to make these decisions, once you start to do that, you start seeing opportunities everywhere, everywhere. Now, before we jump into our, pa uh, our passage, this in psychology is known as the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon or the frequency illusion, that you start seeing these opportunities everywhere. And this frequency illusion, let me explain it to you this way. If you ever notice this, I'm sure you've, you've known this, if you've ever heard this before, um, you've known this with yourself. Think about the last time you purchased a car. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that as soon as you purchase a new car, we, we purchased a, a, a Chevy Impala a couple of years ago, all of a sudden you're kind of driving the car and you begin to realize, oh my gosh, there's a lot of Impalas on the road, you know? Everyone else on the road seems to be driving an Impala. Now, everyone didn't go out and buy the same car that you have. What's happening? Your brain, my brain, is, active, is adjusting because it's noticing the things that are important to you. Your brain actually adapts, so to speak. All of those cars were on the road before. It's that you just didn't notice them until you took the step, the action of purchasing the car. And the same is true with so many things in life, including generosity. And once we start living generously, our brain, this is a cool thing, our brain will start to search for more and more opportunities. Does that make sense? 
when we activate our generosity, our brain starts to look for other ways to be generous. The bottom line is, you already know this, generous people do generous things. They're aware, they become more aware, and then they act on those needs. Generous people do generous things. <clears throat> now, why is it then, with all that, why is it then that so many of us who desire to be generous, at times myself included, but so few of us are actually living out that kind of generosity in our lives? Why, why is it such a struggle, you know? And that's where I think, in part, what our passage today will explain for you and I today. So, if you have your Bible, open up to Mark chapter, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. And we're going to take a look at a story that's probably very, very well known for many of you, especially if you're a Christian. Um, even if you're not, maybe you've heard of the story before. Maybe when you went to church a long time ago, you might have heard of the story. It's a great story. Um, and I want to take a little bit of a different angle to it. Matthew chapter 14, and let's start with verse 15. As evening approached, Jesus has been teaching, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, Jesus, and it's really getting late. It's getting dark. So send the crowds away so they can go to the village and buy themselves some dinner, some food. But Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Well, they said, we only have five loaves of bread and only two fish. <laughs> now, let me just stop there. <clears throat> he is surrounded, not by hundreds, but by thousands upon thousands of people. They've gathered to see him. He's teaching. I mean, you, you, he's healing people. Um, the blind are seeing. The lame are walking. And the passage tells us, that there was actually 5,000 men present. So most scholars, most experts believe, if you include women and children, that number could have been closer to anywhere from 12 to 20,000 people total. It's a pretty good-sized crowd. If it starts to get late in the day, the disciples come to Jesus with a very valid problem. As they notice it's getting dark, people haven't eaten dinner. They would typically you know, work throughout the day. When it gets dark, that's when you would go in and you'd have your typical evening meal. And they're concerned, which is a good thing, about the people. Because then they'll be forced to travel at nighttime. Now, why is that important? Well, travel at nighttime in that region in the ancient world was very dangerous. So when they come to Jesus, they're not complaining. I, I always thought that was they were complaining. They're not being petty. They're not complaining. Quite the opposite, as a matter of fact. They've identified a legitimate need, a legitimate need impacting a very <laughs> large group of people. And the disciples did exactly what all of us, I would hope, who believe in Jesus have been taught to do. They identified a need, and they brought that need to Jesus. That's what they're supposed to do, right? That's what the Bible tells us to do, right? When you see a problem, identify a need, you bring it to Jesus. You pray about it. So that's what makes actually Jesus' response here very confusing. Again, verse 16, after they, they, you know, Jesus, here's the problem, send them away. So they can go to the village, they can get their dinner, maybe we can start over again in the morning. <laughs> but he simply said in verse 17, or verse 16, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. When Jesus, when the disciple, disciples come to Jesus with a problem, he responds to his disciples, you solve it. He doesn't perform a miracle. He doesn't give them a solution. Interesting, he puts the responsibility back on the disciples. Puts it back on his disciples. And the disciples respond exactly the way that probably we all would have responded. We stop and think about that. Their, their verse 17 reaction was really pretty astonishing and pretty much a reality. There's 12 to 20,000 people, okay? Yo, Jesus, all we've got is five loaves of bread and a couple of fish. That's all we got left. That's all we have food wise. In other words, there's no way we can feed these people. What Jesus, what he's doing is he puts the responsibility back in his disciples. It's their first response is they make sure that Jesus understands their limitations. What, he's, what they're really saying is this. We don't have enough. <laughs> that little statement, we got five loaves of bread and two fish. The under, underlying communication is Jesus, we don't have enough. <laughs> there's a need awareness, but we don't have enough. Now let me just stop there. Have you ever felt that way? I know I have. You see a problem? Maybe it's in the world. <laughs> Maybe it's in your neighborhood. 
Maybe it's with a, a friend or a family member. And there's an opportunity to be generous. But if we're really honest, the first thought that comes to our mind, I don't have enough. Whether it's time, resources, belongings, attention, influence, I don't have enough. And so we identify opportunities to be generous, and then the reality is we allow our limitations to keep us from acting. We allow our limitations from keeping us from taking action. And so why, my question is, why does our desire to be generous not translate into actual generosity? <laughs> I think the answer is this. Maybe the real reason is because we allow our limitations to stop us. We really do. Much like the disciples in this story. <laughs> but Jesus doesn't let his disciples off the hook. Just like he doesn't let us off the hook either. He doesn't say to them, oh, I guess you're right. There's just too many people, not enough food. So instead, you know, just send them away. You know, you're right. Instead, he, he gets very poignant. Verse 18. Bring those things. Bring them here, the bread and the fish, to me, he said. Bring them to me. And Jesus tells his disciples to bring what they have, what they have, and simply give it to him. There's the principle. You bring what you have, and you give it over to God. And you see, those five loaves of bread... <laughs> Those two fish, that's all they had to feed. And there's no way it was going to feed 20,000 people. They're not wrong in their assessment. They didn't have enough food. But the mistake they made was that they were focused and looking in on their limitations <laughs> instead of looking to Jesus. Yeah, I'm, I'm guilty of that. My guess is if you stop and you pause for a moment, you're probably guilty of that as well. Recognize the need, your awareness. <laughs> Spirit might nudge you a little bit, you know, do this or do that. Oh, man, I can't afford that. I, I can't take that much time with that person. I can't, you know, I, I got to do this, I got to do that. Or It's our default. And they make the mistake of looking too much, too much at their limitations instead of looking at Jesus. So they are so focused on what they don't have, they fail to see what they did have. What they have? <laughs> They had Jesus right there with them. And look what happens when the disciples look past their limitations and they bring what they have to Jesus. Verse 19 of Matthew 14, let me get your story again. It says this, As he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up into heaven, he gave thanks. And he broke the le le uh, loaves of bread, and he gave them to his disciples. And, and he goes on, The disciples gave them to the people. And the reality is, verse 20, they all ate and they were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls. Those aren't like little basketfuls. These are known as really large basketfuls, 12 of them, of broken pieces that were left over. Verse 20, the number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. I mean, isn't this just amazing? <laughs> Something miraculous happens when we move off of our limitations, and we just simply give what we have to Jesus. See, Jesus does what the disciples could never do on their own. But he doesn't do it, and here's what I want you to understand, emphasize it. He doesn't do it until the disciples take a step of action. There it is. There's the principle. He doesn't do it for them. More than likely, he won't do it for us. We've got to take that step of faith. We've got to take that step. Take that step of action. It's possible. Jesus has amazing things he, want to, he wants to do in the world. And he wants to take your effort and my effort and multiply it in ways that we could never dream or imagine. It's possible. Jesus wants to do all these things. <laughs> this is one of the things I wrote down. But he's waiting on me and he's waiting on you. Take the first step. That's it. He's waiting. <laughs> He's waiting for us to take the first step, to take some action. That's faith. That's faith. <laughs> I like the way an older church father said it this way, St. Augustine said it this way, without God, we cannot. That's <laughs> so true. Without us, God will not. Think about that. Without God, we cannot. Without us, God will not. He wants to use you. He wants to use me. He wants us to take action. 
He's waiting on his people to move from a desire to be generous to actual generosity. As much as you do with the loaves and the fish, when we take an action of generosity, he will multiply our efforts and multiply the impact. If I was going to put this in a formula, like in a little bit of equations, it kind of looks like this. What we have, plus who God is, is more, always more than enough. That's it. It's more than enough. He's more than enough. But we got to give it to him and take an action step. It's really that simple. <laughs> we have to look past our faith limitations and bring what we have to God, whatever it is, whatever time it is, whatever resource it is, whatever attention we can give at that time. And if we do that, God wants to use that and multiply that in our lives and other people's lives as well. He's just looking for people to be faithful. And not only does it bring us closer to the heart of God, <laughs> I've even learned generosity. There's studies out there that show that it helps people physically. Those people who live generous lives, as I shared last week, actually helps their blood pressure, lowers the risk of things like dementia, anxiety, depression, reduces your cardiovascular risk, all this because generosity increases joy and happiness. It's truly better to give than to receive. I want to share, you know, as I wrap this up, you know, this whole idea then of this idea of how do we do it then? How do we move, you know, from a, from a desire? Okay, I know I want to be generous. Okay, I, I see the passages. I know Jesus. I but I get negative or I look at my limitations when I don't have the bills that are, whatever it is, you know? And so how do I do it? Like anything, <laughs> anything. Here's my encouragement. Just start small. Just start small. <laughs> That's it. All you have to do is start small. Let, let it be small and simple. Many times we delay generosity because we're waiting for it to be bigger or better or we're waiting for more of our own resources. Again, I believe God is providing opportunities for generosity right where we're at. And we need to start with the people right where we're at, right where we see them every day at work, in our families, in our homes. You know, if we're faithful with the small things, God will keep providing opportunities. Proverbs 11.24 says this way, One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly but comes to poverty. Here's the principle, pithy little statement, most of the time true. When you give freely, you get so much more back. It's such a principle all throughout the scripture. It's better to give than to receive. More blessed to give. When we become more generous, the world gets bigger and the opportunities become more frequent. Just start with where you're at. Don't allow your limitations to keep you from giving to what God has given to you. Trust him to multiply your efforts and your resources. Move from a desire this day, from just desire to being generous. It's great to have a desire. It has to start there. Awareness. But actually moving into generosity. And if you do, I can promise. I can. I really can because the Bible teaches this, that you'll be blessed. So God's waiting on you. All you got to do is do something. So what will you do? What will you do? You know, so many different opportunities. This week I've had to just be with people, um, spend time with people, to be generous, my resources, my belongings. And uh, it, it's, it's not hard. Just start small. For some of you, I remember a couple weeks ago, maybe I should this, I forget last time or not, but you know, one of the things that we did is just take, you know, awareness, take action. And we used to always support a compassion child. Oh, gosh, for many, many years, probably the first two decades of our marriage and our family life. And I'll, I'll be honest, it's just our last one kind of grew up and you know, graduated the program and we never got a new one. And it's been a few years and we were at a concert and, and uh, that was one of the things they were, they, were, they were promoting and thankful for that. And Val looked at me, I looked at her and it was a no brainer. Yeah, we, can, we need to do that. We've always wanted to be, you know, not only do we give to the church here, the ministry at EFC, uh, we try to give to missionaries, we try to also give to those who are in poverty, those who are marginalized, especially around the world and locally as well. And I'm telling you, that was a real blessing. And, and we just got, as a matter of fact, today, I didn't get a chance to read it, uh, but I got the mail today. We have our first letter, you know, from our compassion child in, in Africa and a little girl. And uh, I'm looking forward to writing her back. So just start wherever you're at, you know. Um, maybe, for, maybe you're listening for, the, you know, you've been listening to this uh, at EFC here for maybe many months or throughout the pandemic. And, and, and maybe, you know, you, you've been thinking about, you know, hey, maybe I should help be, you know, generous by just helping support the ministry at EFC. Just start small, you know. Well, I can't do 10% or I can't do 8%. That's okay. 
you just start whatever God puts in your heart. You know, it's just a way to start. And if it's not maybe our ministry at EFC, that we would love that. We would love your support and your partnership with us. We have a great need. Um, like so many other churches, we're, we're down, um, you know, in our in our income and in our, in our giving, um, which is very typical for a lot of nonprofits and for a lot of churches right now. So anything you can do would be incredibly helpful. But sometimes I, I used to think, man, whether, whether it was a missionary, whether it was meeting a need in my community, I used to think I have to give so much. And part of it is, no, you just start with wherever you're at, whatever you're comfortable, whatever you feel God leads. Look for ways to be generous and take action in your community. This is a great time of the year to help those. Uh, we did that as a whole church with Big Give, but I'm telling you, our ministries like Home Sweet Home and Safe Harbor, maybe wherever you're living at, uh, whether you're in the East Coast or in, in UK or down in, in Arizona, look for ways to give those kinds of homeless shelters and the missions. And, and again, typically you can give so much money, it will help provide uh, a meal for a couple of families. Look for ways to serve. Oftentimes, maybe it's your time. Maybe it's not just your resources. There's ways to actually still serve. My guess is there's a little still looking for people. They're still looking for people to sign up and serve in those meals on Thanksgiving or the day after Thanksgiving. Great ways, just small ways to give back. Um, you know, maybe you've got a, you're, you're, I know that guy, yeah, I shared my plumber story last week, and that guy is just, I, I love that guy, man. He is just generous with his time and simply will bless others in ways that, you know, that is just part of it, the way he's geared in his vocation. Do something. Start small. That's it. That's how you move from an awareness to actually becoming generous. I think God will bless you. But it takes you to take that first step. Then he'll take the loaf of bread that you give him. He'll take the, the fish. He'll multiply it. And he'll bless them, the recipients, and he'll bless you, the giver. Make sense? I want to close because I want you to pray out loud with me wherever you're at. The prayer that I've been sharing last week and this week. So pray with me at first out loud. And then after you're done praying, um, I'll go ahead and kind of pray a little bit just spontaneously. But here's the prayer. You can write this prayer down if you want. God, I want to experience the joy that comes from being generous. And I ask you on this day to help me be generous with anything that comes my way, my time, my resources, my attention, and then I'll be able to recognize it. And then when it happens, I'll have the courage to just simply take action, to jump in and give. God, that's our prayer. And I believe if you start praying this prayer that you'll be moved to more awareness. But Lord, all the awareness of the world isn't going to be helpful if we don't take some simple step of action. <coughs> Help us to be the peop a people of action, a people who are decisive, a people of faith, who not only are more aware and have a feeling of compassion and empathy, but Lord, take that to the point where it will be a sacrifice of our time, maybe our attention, our resources, our money, trusting, with you, trusting you, Lord, with how you will use this, Lord, to be a blessing to others in your kingdom. God, I ask a blessing over everybody here listening to me here today or whenever they're watching this. Help us, Lord, to be thankful. <laughs> we have so much to be thankful for. Yeah, there's a lot of rough stuff out there right now. I mean, my week has been rough with some situations here, Lord, locally. And it's just breaking my heart. But even in the midst of all that, I just pray for some small senses that you're with us that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And whether we're enjoying a meal alone or with family and friends this Thanksgiving, that with you, we're never alone. That you love us right where we're at, but you love us enough not to keep us there. Help us to be more generous out of a heart of thankfulness and generosity and contentment. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in. I want to also share with you too, at this time I'm going to ask the host to share the link at EFC here as Christmas is just around the corner. And I'm telling you, we've got a little bit of a different Christmas this year. We're still going to do things uh, here in person um, in different ways, but we're also going to do a website. The Christmas website is right there on our website, www.efca uh, or efcchurch.org. They'll put it up there. I don't know why I forget those things sometimes. Too much stuff on my mind anyhow. And uh, there's going to be resources. There's an Advent calendar, calendar to do with your kids if you want to do that and use that calendar for an activity every single day. Um, there's ways to serve your neighbors and friends. There's a musical playlist. So some of our staff members have put together um, just different ways 
to share the love of Christ this Christmas with others or to experience that this year. We're still going to have our services. We'll talk more about that next week, both digitally as well as live in person, as well as Christmas Eve, and just a way to be a blessing to others and to serve and to reach and to grow people in Jesus Christ. So be blessed, and we'll see you next week.